of heretical groups that have come in the latter part of the church age, as we get ever closer to the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses are a prominent voice in this movement towards the apostasy. This organization is in large part thanks to prominent figures such as Charles Taze Russell and his Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. For those who are unaware, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is Jehovah manifested in the flesh, and in order to accommodate for their doctrines, they have made their very own Bible version to teach this. While there are many heresies that no hellers are known for, let's take a brief moment to see how modern textual criticism has helped push the narratives of Russell and other heretical groups. One of the greatest attempts to prove that in Jesus does not dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is the claim that 1 John 5 verses 7 and 8, also known as the Johannian comma, which this channel has already made a segment on, does not belong in the Bible. Let's read the passage. 1 John 5 verses 7 to 8 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now since we have read what the Bible says, let's look at a quote by Russell on this verse to show how he felt about the verse and its removal in new versions. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. Zion's Watchtower by Charles Taze Russell July 3rd, 1882 the only text in scripture which was ever claimed to prove or affirm that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one is a portion of 1 John 5 verses 7 to 8. This appears only in manuscripts written since the 5th century and is acknowledged by all Trinitarians to be a forgery. So undisputable is this that the translators of the revised version recently published omit the clause without note or comment, though those revisers were themselves believers in Trinity. Like some other doctrines received by Protestants through papacy, this one is received and fully endorsed, though its adherents are aware that not a word of scripture can be adduced in its support. Nay more, anyone who will affirm this unscriptural doctrine as his faith is declared by the action of the Evangelical Alliance to be non-Orthodox, a heretic. One detail to consider is that the Bible does not say the Son, but instead says the Word, which John 1 already shows that this is God despite the corruption the New World Translation has in John 1 verse 1 by saying the Word was a God. The idea of there being another God to worship would go directly against the first of the Ten Commandments. Another interesting factor is that Russell comments on the revised version by Fenton John Anthony Hort in Brookfoss Westcott. Their revision that they had made was based on the evidence of two manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which are claimed to be oldest and best, and yet this claim is not as airtight as the Alexandrian textual critics would like to admit. If we look at Westcott and Hort, we'll see that these men were not saved. There's just no way these men were born again. Hort didn't believe in Christ's atonement for sin, didn't believe the creation account was real, as he subscribed to evolution, did not believe in the final authority of scripture, and hated the Protestant Reformation. Westcott didn't believe in any miracles, even in the Bible, denied the exclusivity of Christ, and worshipped Mary. 
They also both belonged to a secret society called the Ghostly Guild, which practiced divination and occultism. The reason why this should be of concern for Christians out there is not only because there are multiple issues with the codexes themselves, but the work of Westcott and Hort have laid the foundation for what is not only modern biblical textual criticism, but also the groundwork for nearly all new Bible versions. The fact is that 1 John 5 verse 7 has been used ever since Christianity began being one of the greatest verses of the Godhead in the Bible. As we get closer to the end of the world, let's hear some warnings about the days to come. 2 Timothy 3 verses 13 to 15 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 4 verses 2-4 Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15 For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. End times deceptions are to be expected, and it will only get worse as we reach the end. What JWs and New Version Committees rely on is believing the scriptures need to be recovered so they can avoid accountability for what God has already established. But then that comes down to the fact that they are being deceived themselves. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And it is written, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. God has preserved his word, as carried down through the received text and perfectly preserved in the King James Bible. And where the word of a king is, there is power.